Scott Rideshell. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, on the line, we've got Brad Pierce. He writes the Wayward Rabbler over there on Substack, and we also run him at the Libertarian Institute as well. Welcome back to the show, Brad. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, man, very happy to have you here. A very interesting piece. The CIA admits its longtime presence in Ukraine, and this is the big one in the New York Times from a few weeks ago now, February the 25th. The spy war, how the CIA secretly helps Ukraine fight Putin. So tell me, what'd you learn from the big NYT piece here? Well, you know, it's another classic example of going from, you know, saying something is a baseless conspiracy theory to saying, of course, we're doing that. And here's why it's a good thing. <clears throat> um, in short, they, you know, admitted directly that as soon as the Maidan revolution happened, that Ukraine's new spy chief called in the CIA and MI6 and they set up what could only be fairly described as an anti-Russian conspiracy to, you know, use Ukraine as what is described as a beachhead against Russia in the region and to, you know, basically counter Russian influences throughout. So there's really no other way to look at it, but that Ukraine intentionally threw in with Russia's enemy and worked very hard to make itself a threat to Russia. And of course, the purpose of this article was to guilt people into funding Ukraine more on the grounds of, you know, we cannot abandon them like our erstwhile allies in Afghanistan. But strangely, it got very little notice at all, which, I mean, I guess the New York Times is really increasingly irrelevant, um, more so even than one would imagine. Yeah. Well, and it's their fault for employing Charlie Savage, the disgusting liar, along with David Sanger and... Uh, formerly Michael Gordon and all of Scott Shane and all the hoaxers of the Russiagate scam and the rest of that. No wonder nobody pays any attention to them. Yeah, well, and it's really funny because, you know, whenever there's like a leak that tells us something we really do need to know, they go on and on about, oh, you're endangering people. You know, there's these sources and methods you're revealing. You know, Assange is still in, in prison and like they're public enemy number one for this. And of course, there was none of that hemming and hawing about this because the CIA very clearly directly invited journalists in to tell them this whole big story that, you know, was supposedly like a secret. It's really an incredible thing. And I, they must have thought that this was going to make everyone want to fund Ukraine more. And they did not realize that by publishing this, they were really you know, agreeing with most of Russia's grievances about Ukraine that they used as a justification for launching their war. Yeah. And and for that matter, the Americans who are opposed to this intervention there. So um, as you say, they talk about this going all the way back to uh, 2014. I don't guess they specifically mentioned Brennan's trip to Kiev just after the revolution there. But he clearly at the time, I think USA Today revealed it first and he clearly had agreed with or even possibly ordered them to start what uh, the interim president at that time and then later Petro Poroshenko called a war on terrorism against the people of the east of their own country. Yeah, and you know what's really been kind of strange about all of this, because I've written some other things uh, about the general premise of how it is that this awful, you know, narrow faction of like uh, pro-Western nationalist pseudo-intellectuals took over this entire large country. And, you know, something that's very strange is that they could not possibly make the kind of horrible uh, neoliberal tech dystopia that they want to turn Ukraine into if they have to incorporate these people into their country that live in the regions that Russia currently controls. So it's hard to come to a different conclusion than that they desire to oppress this part of their population more than they love life itself. 
Yeah. Well, and here they are losing the entire south and east of the country. The only question at this point in the war is whether the Russians are going to go ahead and take Odessa and the entire southern coast or whether they'll be happy with the four provinces they've already taken. Now, I don't guess yeah. you figure that 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 was the plan that, well, we want rid of these Russians, so we'll just start a war, let Russia take the south and the east, but make it very expensive for them to do so. They must have thought that they were going to get away with it. You know, I've wondered this whole time whether Ukraine was intentionally used as a sacrificial pawn or whether they actually thought this was going to work. And as ever with government, the evil incompetent matrix is kind of the hardest thing to read about any government action. Yeah, exactly. Stupidity or the plan. Well, yeah. it's a stupid plan, that's all. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it is almost always some combination of both. It's just a matter of which one is predominant in that specific situation. Yeah. And now, you say here that when they created this specialized anti-Russia division, and then again, this goes back, we're not talking about 22, we're talking about 14, just after the bogus so-called revolution of dignity, which is absolutely hilarious. Um, but uh, you say that or the time story here says that they recruited exclusively young people born after the fall of the Soviet Union. Did they say why exactly? Oh yeah. They were like, Oh, they, because they didn't want anyone, you know, with dual loyalty, to, well, to your Russia, but they wanted people only with dual loyalty to, you know, the U S and the UK. But yeah, they said, I mean, obviously kind of facetiously, you know, these people don't even know what the USSR was. So they just really wanted people that, uh, you know, had absolutely no connection to it. And it's kind of strange, you know, it takes a long time to detach. So you have to figure all of those people still went to school, educated by people that were, you know, by teachers that were educated under the Soviet Union. You know, all of their parents grew up under it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's the main thing that struck me about that is how young that meant they were. Because that was only like 23 years after the fall of the Soviet Union. So you're running this whole complex operation against, you know, the world's largest country that has the largest nuclear arsenal with a bunch of people that would barely be out of college if, the, you know, the oldest ones would barely be out of college if they mm -hmm. went at all. And which is funny, too, because it seems to me, I don't know, like the harder feelings would be among the people who actually did grow up under the Soviet Union, which was, after all, a totalitarian police state. And I know from members of my family, my wife is from Ukraine that it's the Soviet Union that they absolutely hated and feared. And Russia, maybe not their favorite, but doesn't compare to the totalitarian monster that was the USSR and its domination of Ukraine up yeah, until well, 1991. Yeah, several interesting things about that. I mean, one of which is that the older people that were running this obviously had yet yeah, lived under the Soviet Union. Um, it's not clear that a bunch of people whose early childhood memories were the uh, post-Soviet hell era of the 90s that, you know, Ukraine kind of never left would be the best people for this anyway. Uh, so, yeah, and no part of that really made that much sense to me. But, you know, what else is strange about this is that it was all the people that were total in, like in our society, at least. It's all the people who were total apologists for the Soviet Union when it did exist that now claim to hate current Russia because it's communist when, you know, current Russia mm -hmm. is not communist. It's all very irrational. Yeah, seriously. Well, and it's funny that Joy Reid famously called Russia a communist country on MSNBC, revealing that she really didn't have the first clue about the history of the world that she lives in whatsoever. She probably thinks you got to go west to get there. Yeah, I mean, none of them have, have any clue about it. And, you know, the other thing that's very frustrating is that obviously Ukraine was a full constituent member of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, people from of Ukrainian descent w were in charge of the Soviet Union for more years than people that were fully Russian. You know, though the peoples are very closely linked. So yeah, it's, it's all very strange, but you can see that what they've had to do is turn it into something that is solely based on ethnic hatred, such as the New York Times talking about how these men that were presumably in their 50s were, you know, booing that star hockey player because he was a Russian national. Like, why would you trust anyone that immature and ridiculous and full of hate to do a sensitive matter like espionage against Russia? It's it's yeah. absolute nonsense. Well, and when they say that they really wanted anti-Russia zealots who express a hatred of all Russian speakers. That sounds like just code for Azov Battalion and right sector C-14 type Nazis, no? 
Yeah, I mean that's that's exactly my thought. So yeah, what they came with that they had a uh, they named the division after some I don't know like Estonian joke or something about how you would club a fish in the head because it speaks Russian because no Russian speakers can be trusted, and it's a you know a, a huge portion of your pre-war population speaks Russian at home, so you're obviously saying that it's anyone that speaks Russia is bad. And you know of course the other thing about this is most people in Ukraine did not historically view Russia as a language of oppression. It was like the language of, you know, social advancement and education and getting good jobs in, you know, engineering and science and stuff like that. So this is really kind of a historic myth that they made up that everyone felt like they were oppressed by, you know, speaking Russian at work if they spoke Ukrainian at home. It's all very ahistorical. Yeah. And, you know, I think the Soviets did force people to speak Russian, uh, you know, in the schools and that kind of thing. But, essentially they adopted it in all the major cities and you know according to my wife is basically just people who for you know were poor peasants out in the countryside who spoke ukrainian she's from odessa and only one of her aunts spoke ukrainian at all they all are russian speakers yeah well i just reviewed the book towards the abyss by volodymyr Ashinko, who's a um like a com or he's like a marxist uh sociologist from ukraine that is you know very unpopular with the people in charge there and yeah, he, he said very much it was viewed as a country language versus city language, and that since the languages are so similar anyway, people did not think that much about speaking one at work and speaking another one at home. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if you go, you know, all the way west to Lviv, it's different, but certainly on the entire southern coast and in the Donbass and up to Kharkiv, and I think even in Kiev, the idea was it was you know, the town and country split there. Well, I mean, the fact is to manage an enormous empire like the Soviet Union that has like a hundred nationalities in it, you simply have to have a unifying language for which people do, you know, government and business and everything else like that. It's a, it's just a matter of administering it in a reasonable way. Like you're not going to have everyone choose like Buryat or something as your national language. Mm -hmm. And now we're also, well, okay, get into exactly what it was that they're doing here, because this does include strikes inside Russia, right? Yeah, I mean, basically, they were, um, you know, trying to purge Ukraine of all sorts of Russian influence, but it included them, um, you know, launching deadly attacks inside the regions in Donbass that were controlled. There was one instance where they went into Crimea and set up what they basically described as like defensive you know, charges on a uh, train station that they were hoping would stay hidden and then they could, you know, set them off at a later time. They tried to land for an offensive action in uh, in Crimea that turned uh, really bloody and apparently greatly upset Joe Biden, who was the one in charge of this as the vice president. So, you know, it all goes deeply back to him uh, in many ways. And I mean, but basically everything spies would do, they, uh, you know, sent all sorts of intelligence to the U.S. They were deeply involved in um, everything that is called Russia Gate now, and, you know, sending that intelligence to the CIA, which would have been so easy to fake these, you know, supposed interceptions they had, assuming that the CIA even cared if they were real or not, which they probably didn't. So it's, yeah, it's been all sorts of intel like that. And then also the partnership um, you know, had the U.S. helping them target things from as soon as this war began, uh, you know, for all sorts of different attacks. It was really just uh, basically everything that intelligence agencies would coordinate on if they were trying to undermine, you know, a hostile power that they considered to be an enemy. Mm -hmm. And now, so what about the Russians in, in do you know if TASS and RT and the rest did big I told you so's about this and said, of course, see, you gave us no choice, just like we said. You know, I didn't see them mention it that much either. I've really been looking for any response to this, but, uh, you know, so much of what they said, yeah, was right exactly in line with, you know, what Russia said. And obviously, like, it's a completely different question if any of this justified this enormous war that's caused a massive amount of human suffering. But what it does show that is the thing that is the most important about this is that they've wanted us to believe that, you know, if Russia's not stopped in Ukraine, that, you know, they're going to roll their tanks to Brussels, like they're a threat to, you know, the Baltics and Finland, and they, they want to take Poland and all of this other stuff like that. And it shows very directly that Ukraine's government uh, was threatening them, was intentionally threatening them, was seeking to undermine their state, was, you know, doing all sorts of things. And, and further was 
uh, just uh, oppressing ethnic Russians within Ukraine because they hated them. So it, it really shows that Russia never was a threat to any of the other neighboring nations if they would just behave in a reasonable fashion and, you know, try to have good relations. You know, people have a really negative view of what they call Finlandization during the Cold War. But you would find that Finland went through the entire Cold War in peace, independent, you know, a free country and everything else. So it's kind of weird to act like that turned out badly for them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, same thing with Austria. And you look at the map. Austria's a couple clicks to the west of Ukraine. Uh, seems like we might have been able to settle for neutrality for Ukraine, but no. Yeah, you know what I keep coming back to is in the really famous Melian dialogue in Thucydides, like the deal that uh, the Melians were asking for was what Russia was demanding of Ukraine, and Athens refused to let them remain neutral and then slaughtered their whole city when they refused to take sides. And yeah, and what Russia wanted Ukraine to do was what the Melians were begging for. It's a very interesting comparison. Yeah. Well, all right, so now you say that the article seems to have failed it, you know, you're kind of speculating here, but it seems like the thing was put out as a press release. What essentially to say, look, everybody, here's how deep we really are in this thing. So stop dragging your feet. We're committed here. And, but it, that narrative didn't really take off, huh? No, it, I mean, I've not seen this mentioned anywhere at all. Uh, it does not seem to have gotten them any closer to getting the funding. The only people that have noticed are all of the people that were already skeptical of our Ukraine policy. And, of course, you know, we all know about what you would call like, the prior investment trap or the sunk cost fallacy or whatever. Like, that's what they're arguing here is actually no reason to um, – you know, to continue a bad policy. And for my part, I've been trying to tell Ukraine and its supporters that they were ultimately going to get abandoned this whole time. So, you know, I, I tried to warn them it was going this direction. I feel like absolutely no guilt about my country ultimately abandoning them. Uh, but that's just me. But yeah, it, it yeah, certainly well, is not all of us who opposed this. Them. I mean, it's been so obvious all along. Joe Biden yeah. said from the very beginning, we are not putting our army infantry in there. The 3rd yeah. Infantry Division, the 82nd Airborne, the U.S. Navy, we're not coming, which is another way of saying protecting Ukraine from Russia is actually not an important American interest. And it also goes to show then, it makes the whole question of bringing them into NATO, uh, you know, uh, obvious controversy here where we're clearly not willing to risk direct war with Russia, or not that much of a risk, of direct war with Russia over Ukraine. So if Biden had somehow succeeded in pushing NATO membership through before the war and Russia attacked, then we would have sent the 82nd Airborne and gone to nuclear war then? Or we'd have said, actually, Article 5 is written pretty vaguely and you guys are screwed, the same as we're doing right now. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, um, two years ago, Kaya Kallis, the prime minister of Estonia, admitted that NATO's defense strategy for the Baltics in a major war with Russia is that they will just be occupied with Russia. And then, you know, the U.S. or, you know, NATO will liberate them at a later time, which is crazy. But uh, it, they're completely indefensible. And, yeah, similarly, I, I just don't know who's going to go there for Ukraine. But, you know, they're kind of getting their own uh, piecemeal ramshackle NATO because several major countries – uh, such as, you know, France, the um, United Kingdom and Italy have given them and Canada, for that matter, have given them like basically separate security guarantees or made separate mutual defense pacts. And of course, it's not actually a mutual defense pact between Italy and Ukraine because no one's going to attack Italy and there's no chance Ukraine would be able to help them if someone did. So it is just a one way security guarantee. And it's funny because this is exactly what's what's well, not funny, but it's exactly what started World War II was that, you know, Poland took the security guarantee from the United Kingdom, who was unable to physically access their country to defend them. And then, you know, Poland acted uh, really arrogantly and unwise because they felt they had the security guarantee from, you know, the world's great empire of the day. And then Poland got, you know, partitioned and completely destroyed and suffered untold horrors. And everyone learned the wrong lesson from this. And I, I don't know how that's possible, but, you know, the only thing about history people know about is World War II and they know all of the wrong things about it. 
yeah, the lesson is America and Britain and France and the Soviet Union should have all ganged up and invaded Germany as soon as Hitler took Czechoslovakia. Yeah, that's the only that's that's their only idea in regards to this. And, uh, you know, quite clearly, I think Poland could have just been more wise in a variety of ways. You really should not take security guarantees from anyone who would be unable and unwilling to defend you. But no one has learned this lesson. Yep. Hey, guys, I've had a lot of great webmasters over the years, but the team at expanddesigns.com have by far been the most competent and reliable. Harley Abbott and his team have made great sites for the show and the Institute, and they keep them running well, suggesting and making improvements all along. Make a deal with expanddesigns.com for your new business or news site. They will take care of you. Use the promo code SCOTT and save $500. That's expanddesigns.com. Man, I wish I was in school so I could drop out and sign up for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom instead. Tom has done such a great job on putting together a classical curriculum for everyone from junior high schoolers on up through the postgraduate level. And it's all very reasonably priced. Just make sure you click through from the link in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. Real history. Real economics. Real education. Hold on just one sec. We've got to make some money here. Man, Starbucks support for Israel's ethnic cleansing campaign is almost disgusting as their coffee. Don't you just hate them? You, me, and a lot of other people, too. It's time to boycott and divest from those genocidal blood-drinking traitors at Starbucks. But you're still going to need your caffeine in the morning. Well, you guys are going to love Mundo's coffee. It's so good, and the price is right. Check out a massive variety of awesome-tasting coffees at mundosartisancoffee.com. You'll be glad you did. That's MundosArtisanCoffee.com. And then, you know, in bringing the Baltics into um, NATO in the second round there, they really did create, as you're saying, that they admit themselves here that the Estonian minister saying, well, you know, yeah, we would just be occupied and then hope for the best later. Now look at a map of where those Baltic states are. How in the world is the United States of America supposed to liberate them? We're going to move our entire army to, uh, you know, France and Germany and then move them through Poland to attack the Russians in the Baltics. Or we're going to get into a naval war in the Baltic Sea and take that over and land our Marines. We're talking thermonuclear war in that event. Everybody knows that. And they've, you know, as Pat Buchanan warned back in 1999, you bring the Baltics in. Now you're leaving Kaliningrad, this extremely Mm. important city and naval port that still belongs to the Russians, behind NATO lines. They're separated from them by uh, Belarus, their ally, but also by Lithuania. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a crazy thing to do. And it's also strange because, yeah, that's why they've had to build this false narrative that Russia is inherently a threat to everyone. The reality is that these Baltic states, besides, you know, being like chihuahuas that are so aggressive despite being so tiny, uh, is that it's actually good for a huge country like Russia to have tiny, basically harmless countries next to them that have mostly free trade and whatnot. There's any number of reasons that it's a good, you know, to have them just as little harmless buffers that everyone agrees are neutral. And, you know, they weren't actually threatened by Russia in any way. But, uh, they're, I mean, they're deranged with hatred. Uh, there was recently someone in the American Conservative, uh, I don't remember what the article was called, but that said it's like a rule that the smaller and weaker and closer to Russia these countries are, the more relentlessly, uh, recklessly aggressive they are towards Russia. Mm. And it, yeah, it's absolutely like that. Yeah, it sounds like something Doug Bondo would say. Uh, it wasn't him. It was oh, someone okay. whose name I didn't recognize. All right. But yeah, it was a really, really good quote. Yeah, he always quotes, there's this movie, The Mouse That Roared, about this, oh, yeah, yeah. this little make-believe country in Europe that starts a big fight. And, you know, he says, we collect our allies like baseball cards without ever asking whether this does us any good at all to bring these countries who couldn't possibly assist us in any way. You know, they say about Ukraine and Georgia, well, they helped us in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah, well, thanks for nothing. Yeah, right. You know? Well, the- 
What's funny to me about this, too, is that they're always so hostile to Turkey, who's like one of the only members of NATO that's actually legitimately useful in a major armed conflict right. and like has a large army and a willingness to fight and everything. And it's like, you know, NATO is supposed to be a military alliance. It's not like a gentleman's club of westernized liberal democracies or whatever. So like either it's a military alliance, in which case Turkey's probably literally the most important member besides the United States. Or it's not, in which case, yeah, let's fill it up with these tiny nations that could never help us in any way. Yeah. And of course, I mean, if you're just completely one dimensional in your thinking, then yeah, it makes perfect sense. Oh, the larger our <laughs> nuclear umbrella and the larger our mutual security system and all these things, and the less likely it is that anyone will dare to mess with us. Until they do, in which case we have a real problem. You know, you could take it to, you know, gangs in the neighborhood, right? You consolidate all the different branches of the Crips. Now, any one of them can get you into a full scale war with the Bloods, even if you were trying to avoid that, you know? Yeah, it's it's wildly irresponsible. And I mean, it's just really another sign of how, uh, I don't know, unserious and intellectually bankrupt our supposed like elite class are because, uh, you know, for all the problems with like Cold War thinking, there were truly some, you know, great minds there, like, you know, George Kennan and other people like that setting these policies that uh, at least had a deep understanding of how the world works and, you know, kind of had like big ideas and everything. And the people we have running the show now are just absolute idiots that don't uh, kind of even understand what a military alliance is for. They don't understand how deterrence works. They don't understand how you get tripped into major conflicts that you can't get out of. You know, Justin Arimondo wrote in 2014 that, you know, Ukraine having exploded, you know, may bring us into a paroxysm or something like that, which, you know, no one can extricate themselves from. And that's basically what exactly is happening in this conflict. No one knows of a way out of it. We've just set up ever more tripwires. Everyone is arming up. It's very much like when everyone knew World War I was coming and they just wanted a little bit more time to build more weapons instead of actually trying to stop it. It's, uh, right. it's very bleak. Yeah. Ken and nothing. I'll settle for Robert Gates now. You know, at least right, he— exactly. You know, he complained that, geez, come on, guys, this isn't just a social club. This is a war guarantee. This is serious business. And they act like it really is just the name of a cocktail party circuit where all these people get to dress up fancy and have attention paid to them. You know? yeah, and that's basically what it is, I guess, besides the fact that it could end all of humanity through their idiocy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, you know, Romano also said in 2014 that yeah, it's perfectly fine to break up the Czech Republic and Slovakia. What's the problem, man? We broke up the Soviet Union. You say you're against secession. Ron Paul likes to say, well, America seceded from Great Britain. You got a problem with that? You know, we're all in favor of the Baltics and, and Ukraine. And Lord knows they've tried three times to overthrow the government of Belarus because they want to separate Belarus from Russia. Well, why not just separate East and West Ukraine? Yeah, Why you know what's really funny about that, the Belarus situation, is that they want to blame all of Ukraine's problems on Russia, but Belarus is basically still a communist country and is very close to Russia and has a substantially higher GDP per capita than Ukraine does. So it really uh, it's basically provably untrue that Russia is the root cause of Ukraine's problems. Yeah, seriously. Um, and, you know, I didn't even know. I've, I've been learning a lot as I'm writing this book about the color-coded revolutions that I didn't... I don't think I even knew about the failed regime change, the white stork conspiracy, they called it, the attempt to overthrow the government of Belarus in 2001. And, of course, Bush tried again in 2005 with the Denim Revolution, and Joe Biden tried, or no, I'm sorry, Donald Trump tried, uh, his government anyway. I don't know if he was even read in on it, but um, his government tried in 2020 to overthrow the government of Belarus again. I mean— Forget Ukraine. Think about how important Belarus is to Russia and how far they might go to prevent such a thing if it ever became a real danger, which it really wasn't. Um, but Lord knows Why? they tried three times. Imagine the Russians not in a ridiculous MSNBC conspiracy theory, you know, cooked up by the FBI counterintelligence division. But what if Russia had actually tried to overthrow the government of Canada three times? We'd have gone to nuclear war over that. 
Well, you know, firstly, people always use theoretical examples about what would we do if whoever aligned with Russia. But, you know, the, the Cuba did align with the USSR and our um, ruling class has been throwing an impotent fit about it for like 65 years now. So right. we, we know exactly how they would behave. Um, but, yeah, regarding Belarus is a funny thing, because in 2020, um, you know, Lukashenko was actually kind of trying to have some rapprochement with the West uh, and may, maybe distance himself from Russia a little bit. And then they tried to do a color revolution on him. And then, of course, they just drove him to be closer to Russia than ever. Oh, I need to know more about that. His uh, cozying up to the West in 2020. I don't have that in my book yet. I mean, I think uh, it was Mark Ames that I saw say something about it. But I mean, it was mostly just, yeah, trying to make relations somewhat better and, uh, yeah, kind of thaw a little bit and that sort of thing. And that's exactly when they... Um, I don't know, decided it was a good time to make their move because uh, Regime Change Inc. are very stupid people. Yeah, uh, they are extremely. And, you know, by the way, as long as we're talking about this, I just read the greatest book that I had completely overlooked until very recently, and I just poached a ton of footnotes out of it. It's called The New Cold War by Mark McKinnon, who's, uh, I had read some articles by him about... Um, I think probably the Orn. No, no, no. I think the Rose Revolution in 03 in Georgia uh, that he had written for the Toronto Globe and Mail. But he has this excellent book about all the color coded revolutions up through 2007. That is, and it's funny because he's somehow on the side of the war party in the thing, but he just tells you everything you need to know about their interventions there. It's really, you know, far beyond what I had even realized. Um, going back uh, to, they even did a color coded revolution against their buddy Tujman in Croatia, stabbed him in the back. Um, and then he died anyway, but they were prepared to overthrow their buddy after they had helped him murder so many people. Yeah. You know, another really good thing on this topic was there was a radio war nerd called, um, death by a thousand NGOs about Kyrgyzstan which is one where they really <laughs> tested out taking a lot of this as far as they could and yeah. like completely destroyed the country. And there's a lot of talk too about how really cynical the people that are, you know, are doing this are, whether it's uh, the kind of cynicism where they just don't care or where they've grown, um, you know, frustrated with how the world works and just have kind of accepted it. But one way or another, these are not, um, you know, like, really optimistic people that think they're doing the right thing. They just see a business here of um, opening everything up to international capital and uh, to give a lot of jobs to absolutely useless people with master's degrees, et cetera. Yep. And to take any country that they possibly can away from Russia or the danger of Russian influence at all. Um, and I love the war nerd, by the way. Um, Mark Ames is absolute scum, but uh, his buddy Gary Brecher is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's it's just a podcast I listen to sometimes. Regardless, that episode was really an interesting in-depth story about how far they took uh how far they took the whole NGO color revolution thing in in Kyrgyzstan because the mm -hmm. um person running the country really did not uh have the personality to oppose them properly, I guess, and uh it just has sent the country to like 20 years of hell. Yep. Yeah, and you know, Romando covered that and Back then, I was his editor and the guy filling his articles with all those links and all of that. So we had all covered that in real time at antiwar.com, uh, along with the Orange Revolution and then the failed Cedar Revolution in 05 and later the failed Green Revolution in Iran in 09 and the rest. So, um, But I had, I had completely missed Albania, Slovakia, Croatia in the 90s before Serbia which was, I guess, Serbia really kicked off in 2000, really kicked off the color-coded revolution era. But there had even been three or four before that. Yeah, well, and, you know, even Slovakia now, they were, like, absolutely losing their mind about the premise that, uh, you know, that Fico would take power again and that he wouldn't be hostile to Russia and, you know, that he wants the Ukraine war to end. And he clearly was, to an extent, radicalized by Maidan happening. I think he could see them doing the same thing to him, basically. Um 
But it's really funny because his party got 23% of the vote and he's Slovakia's longest serving prime minister. And they were trying to say that, oh, this is Russia interfering in their elections. This is a massive influence campaign. Like Russia's the only one that caused this. It's like, do people really think Slovakia's longest serving prime minister getting 23% of the vote in an election is a sign that, you know, there's a vast conspiracy? He probably just has support from um, old people. You know, someone in Eastern from Eastern Europe told me that their view over there is if you get a new guy, he'll just start looting the country all over again, whereas the old corrupt guy's already done it and doesn't really need to steal anymore. And that's probably a big part of why FICO still has a good amount of support in Slovakia. Yeah. And like you said, Lukashenko in Belarus as well, uh, Jonathan Steele, who uh, wrote a great book about the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, called Eternal Russia and is a real expert on that. He had a piece about the Denim Revolution in 2005 in The Guardian that begins something like, well, what would you expect the approval rating or re-election rate to be for a president who, and then he goes through all the statistics of, you know, extremely low poverty, high growth rate, low taxes, high pensions, and economic stability compared to all of their neighbors, well, you'd expect them to be reelected re in a landslide, which is exactly what's going on. The only reason it's illegitimate is because the Americans don't like him because he's friends with Vladimir Putin, period. Yeah, I mean, that's all there is to it. And, it's, and it's which is why no one showed up for the denim revolution either. You know, a few hundred protesters out there and then gone. Yeah, and it's increasingly clear that democracy just means, you know, they're very narrow type of uh, government by incompetent technocrats. Yeah, and loyal to the United States. And if actual democracy decides the other way, well, then the will of the people and the rule of law will just have to burn in hell because George Soros and the NED know better. Yeah, democracy so, you know, means what DC wants. Uh, Vladimir Ashinko said near the end of it, he's like, are we really supposed to believe that, you know, a small group of people that mostly know each other working out of Kiev and Lviv, you know, represent a diverse nation of 40 million people? And it's like, yes, they absolutely want us to believe that this small amount of Western educated hacks that, you know, get paid through the National Endowment for Democracy half the time, um, you know, are representative of everyone in these large, diverse countries. And of course, most people, yeah, just want their pension to be paid properly. They want their food to be affordable and they want, you know, to be able to heat their homes in the winter. Like most people do not actually want their country to be part of a vast ideological struggle between um, two nations, which frankly both have pretty bad hypocritical ideologies that no one should be willing to die for. Yeah. Well, and it's so obvious they're lying when, like, for example, Victoria Newland in that famous speech in front of the big Chevron logo in December of 2013 at the, I forgot the name of the, the group, the American business-backed Ukrainian group there. And she says, oh, when I'm there, I can feel the spirit and the will of the whole of the people of Ukraine. It's like, you damned liar. I'm talking about 20% at best who want this. The entire, and, and even the Washington Post admitted that, like, ah, come on, man. The polls say that at best the country's divided in half on these issues. The whole of the will of the spirit of the people of Ukraine speaking to me. Shut up. Robert yeah, well, Kagan's the ones that speak, fat, disgusting wife. Yeah, the ones that speak to her class of people certainly do. But I mean, you see this in every country in the world. You know, I write about Africa a lot. You see it there too. All these people that you know have been gone to elite schools in the U.S. Or any school in the U.S. and they've got in with everyone there. They want to be the elites in their own country, and they're the most anglophone. They're the most likely to use Twitter. And so they get out there and people that forget that Twitter is not real life and that, you know, the majority of people in a country, yeah, are just normal people that want to support their family and, and have good lives or whatever, um, really get on the belief that like, oh, uh, you know, you get Ursula of Ursula von der Leyen saying, you know, Ukrainians are willing to die for the European perspective. And it's like, OK, I, that is insane. Like it, it, we should not listen to anyone that would die for whatever you consider the European perspective to be. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of a quote from Obama about during the regime change in 2014, where he said, look, it's in America's interest to hear the voice of the people of Ukraine expressing their desire to join this association agreement with the EU. Like, wait, what? 
<laughs> it's it's America's national interest to hear the aspirations of some people in some country 7,000 miles from here to join an association agreement with another continent's trade pact? Yeah, Are you well, kidding of course, me? Well, yeah, what Putin said about, you know, their economy being really integrated into the former Soviet economies was true. So, you know, there are people in the West that think they can get jobs in the, you know, in Europe or whatever. But the people in the East are basically part of old Soviet manufacturing systems that wouldn't really compete in a, you know, in an open market with right. Europe, but need to have an open market with the East. And once again, these are like basic economic issues that are very understandable and they have very little to do with ideology. Yep. And, you know, that's what Eric Margulies said on this show at the time was you got to understand the far east of the country dominated by, uh, you know, pro-Russians and Russian speakers and so forth. That's where all the heavy industry is. But a lot of it is very old and decrepit and they can't possibly compete with EU finished goods at low prices and so much lower prices. And so signing this deal with the EU is essentially a promise to completely bankrupt the industrial east of the country. And then, of course, that was part of the Russians' worry as well, that this was going to be a end run type of a trade deal and that their market was, through Ukraine, going to be flooded with European finished goods that would undermine their own protectionist policies, which I'm against protectionism, but that's their damn business, not mine. Well, yeah, exactly. And once again, it's it's much uh, it's much easier to understand, like, oh, like these people are worried about their pensions than um – to, not everything is a vast ideological struggle. In fact, not that many things are vast ideological struggles except in the minds of the lunatics destroying the world. Yeah. Well, and there's plenty of that, too. Um, you know, where these people, some of these extremely far-right forces in Ukraine are absolutely willing to help lead the world to hell if it means that they can have a ethnically pure country and all of this stuff as they put it themselves yeah it's very very scary stuff you know they keep saying like only ukraine can make this decision for themselves and all of this like absolute hypocritical nonsense about ukrainian sovereignty and it's like okay no if they've chosen national suicide we have to not enable that like we perhaps we can't stop them from doing it i mean we can't obviously but uh we we shouldn't be funding that that's the wrong thing to do like if someone tells you they want to martyr themselves like are you going to hand them a gun like no just yeah. stop it already well and you know look at the potential blowback coming here as well um you know we had this kind of policy in afghanistan we'll bog the russians down bleed them to bankruptcy and we got al-qaeda and the far enemy doctrine out of that mess what are these Nazis going to do, the ones who hadn't already been blown up? What are they going to do after America's done betraying them? Well, it seems that Ukraine keeps threatening us that they will do acts of terrorism in Europe if we uh, abandon Ukraine. So I, I guess that. Yeah. And you're referring directly to statements by Vladimir Zelensky, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't have one on hand. But yeah, they keep saying things like this, like, uh, yeah, if, if, you know, this war ends here, then you're going to be seeing terrorism in Europe. And it's like, is, is that like a threat? Or is that like a, a, an earnest warning to try to help us? Because it sure sounds like the former. Yeah. Well, and I, he might be expressing his own fear there that they're going to have his ass. Because they've threatened him plenty of times before. Oh, yeah. He uh, I, I can't believe his 15 minutes on the world stage has lasted this long. But I mean, I still expect that it's going to end with him, um, you know, leaving the country and uh, spending the rest of his life. I don't know, haunting TV studios when they need to do reminiscences about the, you know, early 2020s or something like that. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, it could end much worse for him. Yeah, we were joking around. It's either Brookings or a bullet. We'll see. Oh, yeah. The old. Uh, yeah, that uh, sounds about right. Yeah. All right, man. Well, i um, happy to have you here to review the bad news with us here. Um, I guess to finish up, it, there was sort of one spin on this thing, too, that you included as a possibility that, you know, rather than maybe arguing the sunk cost that we really better double down now, that instead they're possibly saying we've done everything we can and we've only been able to get this far and maybe now it's time for the Ukrainians to get used to the idea that they're about to get hung out to dry like the Tajiks in Afghanistan. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that could definitely be one look at it. Uh, the other, you know, another per possible perspective is that they know something really, uh, something else really bad is coming out and they think that it's better to get ahead of it. Uh, but I, I think that it's mostly is just begging for funding. You know, our ruling class never takes, they never have an exit strategy. And if an exit miraculously appears, they still never take it. Um, you know, there's countless examples. Um, not ending the war on terror after killing bin Laden is one of them. Uh you know, COVID not just declaring it over once vaccines were available or, you know, any number of things like that. Like they uh, they never have an exit strategy. And even if one shows up, they don't take it. So uh, I, I kind of doubt that they're preparing. They're using it to prepare an exit. I think they just thought that people would see this and think like, oh, the you know, Ukrainians are so passionate about this. We've come this far. We've helped them get to where they are. Now we need to put more money into it. So we you know, our credibility won't be damaged by abandoning them. But it's like, dude, everyone saw us flee the Kabul embassy by helicopter. I, I wouldn't I don't think our credibility was that high when this whole thing in Ukraine began. Yeah, seriously. Well, all right, Brad. Well, thanks for coming on the show and talking about this with us, man. Really important stuff and appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for having me on. All right, you guys, that is Brad Pierce. He is the wayward rabbler over there on Substack, and you can find this one also at the Libertarian Institute. The CIA admits its longtime presence in Ukraine. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.